Hello, hello, and welcome once again to a Beatles program that we call Things We Said Today. This is a weekly show in which we talk about anything and everything that has to do with the Beatles, any part of their past, and even what's going on today. And I'm Ken Michaels, one of the four co-hosts of the show. Some of you might know me from my other Beatles program called Every Little Thing. And I'm being joined by my three other regulars. First of all, we have... Uh, the writer for Beatles Examiner, the number one Beatles news source on the internet, that being Steve Marinucci. Hi, Steve. Hi, Ken. Hello, everyone. And also longtime writer for Beatle Fan Magazine, Al Sussman. Hi, Al. Hi, Ken. Hello there, everybody. And our resident musicologist who's written several books on the Beatles and also writes for Beatle Fan as well as many, many publications, that being Alan Cozen. Hi, Alan. Hi, Ken. Hello, everyone. And Hello. We are, and uh, we are very pleased to have with us a very special guest with us on the show today. And he is someone who is near and dear to us in the Beatle family. He goes all the way back to uh, the early years of the Beatles and... Uh, we know him for several reasons. First of all, John and Paul wrote many songs for him that he recorded, more than any other artist, as a matter of fact. He also was produced by George Martin, the Beatles producer, and he was managed by Brian Epstein, the Beatles manager. And he's had a career ever since then, and he's still going strong, going out there performing all the time now, coming up with uh, new music as well. And that being Billy J. Kramer. Billy, welcome to Things We Said Today. Great. Great to see you all. Billy's a guest with us. Uh, he's, he's on the show today because uh, for a couple of reasons, he has a brand new autobiography out, and it's called Do You Want to Know a Secret? The uh, Lennon-McCartney song, which was his first big hit over in the UK. And he's also going to be a special guest at the upcoming Fest for Beatle Fans, which t- uh, takes place at the Hilton Westchester in Rybrook, New York, on the weekend of April 15th through the 17th. So, Billy, great to have you with us. Great. Nice to see you all. You know, I'm uh, looking forward to coming to the fest. It's always uh, a lot of fun, and uh, they're always great, nice people. You know. You've been a wonderful guest there for many years, and uh, putting on great performances and playing the classics and new material, too. Uh, yep, I, I've, uh, I've had a wonderful time. You know, since I uh, I've been doing the fest, it's it's they've always treated me like royalty, which is wonderful. Mm-hmm. Like well, you that. are. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, all, Thank all, you. All, all all the British Invasion artists, you know, whenever they're there, and we've got a handful of them uh, coming up at the fest, including Chad and Jeremy and Peter Asher and Mike Pender of the Searchers. I thought that we would start just by talking about the very beginning of your life and. What got you into music, and did you always want to be a performer, and especially a singer and a frontman? Was that always uh, your goal? No, 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 not really. I, I was happy to, I wanted to just play guitar behind somebody else and let them sort of uh, take all the pressure, you know. But it, mm-hmm. um, just circumstances, uh, uh, the band said, you know, your guitar playing is not uh, progressing, so why don't you try and sing and see what happens? And fortunately, people liked it. And I I became the front man of the band. And we we started playing around the, all the local hops in, in Liverpool. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And um, we, we got quite a, a good following. And, um, you know, I met the Beatles before they made records. And we did a lot of shows together. And... Um, you know, I was about to pack the whole thing, you know, the whole thing up, and um, funnily enough, uh, Brian Epstein approached me, and, and actually, he was the only person that I always thought that if anybody was to ever ask me, would I, you know, like to do it professionally? Uh, he was the only person that I would have done it for. You know, um, I thought he was the best. I could see what a great job he was doing for the Beatles, and. Uh, I was very flattered when he approached me, and I jumped at the opportunity. You know. Did he ever tell you why he approached you? What what it was about you that um... John Lennon had seen me and said, "Brian, you should sign that that Billy Kramer. He's a good singer." Oh. And that's what happened. 
Also, I he saw me performing at the Mercy Beat Pole, um, which is a Mercy Beat, which the Beatles came top, and mm. I, I can I thought I came third, but I was told recently by my old fan club secretary that I actually came second, mm. and I was I was not professional, and uh, Brian saw me performing at the awards ceremony there too. Mm-hmm. Mm. And shortly afterwards, um, I signed with him. What do you remember about the Beatles in their early years? Did you think they were really going to go places? And you said you knew them before they got a record contract. So did you see uh, them at the Cavern a lot or what? So the first time I saw them, which is in the book, was at um, Little and Town Hall. And I walked home that night and I said to my friends, this was before Brian was managing the meeting. They're going to be bigger than Elvis. They... It had such an impact on the audience. Mm. What was it you saw in them, Billy, at that point? You know, the thing is, I, I always say this, it, it, it's just, you know, stardom or stars to me, it's, it's just something that you really, you can't put, you, there's no, you can't describe it. You know, people just have a certain way, a charismatic way, and it's, it, it pulls you in, you know, which they were great, you know. Um, it was like we had a lot of local, very good bands around Liverpool, but where, when they played at the local hops, you know, they, everybody would stand around the perimeter of the dance hall and hang out and that. But when the Beatles played, everybody ran to the front of the stage. And, um, you know, that that's how much impact they had. You know, and that's which, you know, uh, then, w- whenever they did shows, there was everybody just got at the front before they even started, you know. So, Little in, mm. Little in Town Hall would have been shortly after they came back from Hamburg that first time, I think. And they yes, it was. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So, they had yeah. really galvanized it, you know, into a, a, a very cohesive band by that point. Yes. Um, Stuart Sutcliffe was still with the band. Mm-hmm. The next time I saw them, believe it or not, was was at the cavern, and um, I'd heard a whisper that you know he'd left, and I thought, oh, I wonder if they're going to be as good. But they were even better, you know. <laughs> uh, Paul McCartney was playing bass like he'd been playing his whole life, and I was like, how did you learn to play that good in such a short spell of time, you know? Mm-hmm. And and I I thought they'd really got their act together, you know, more so. You know, and, um, you know, I've, I'm a fan now. I've always been a fan. You know. How would you describe Stu's playing? None of us obviously have ever heard it. So, mm, yeah. Well, and, you know, it was only, with me, it was only that one time. And, you know, I thought they would, the whole thing was very loud and everything. And I wasn't mm-hmm. really, mm-hmm. I wasn't like a, an expert on bands. I was kind of just, you know, starting to put one together myself, you know. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I didn't sort of individually pick, go and analyze each player. You know, it was just the whole, the overall effect of the whole thing. Right, okay. Were you um, impressed at all by the fact that the band had more than one lead singer? That was also because, you know, let's face it, um, they all sang, they all backed each other up vocally, and I'd never seen a band uh, play and sing just like that. Before it was the first time ever, and that obviously I thought was unique, you know. Mm. And and, what about uh, what about Pete Best? What did you observe about him? Uh, Pete if Best, uh, I did, I did, that particular night, I never thought anything about it. But then, when I started doing shows at Aintree Institute and places like that, um, Bob Buller would say, "Let's hear it at the end of the show one more time for John Paul." George, and when Pete got on the stage, the girls just jumped on the stage and went crazy, you know. Mm. That's how it was, you know. They made a great noise. <laughs> was Pete the, uh, who were they, who were they, uh, who were all the girls screaming for at that point? Was it Paul or Pete or? I, I, I think they screamed for, for all of them, but it was when Pete got off the drums at the end of the show to take a bow, that's when they all really freaked out and jumped on the stage. Mm. I think it, it may be in that Jimmy Dean kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Mm. There's there's a, a couple of people I know from 
from over there from the UK tell me that there's still a little bit of resentment um, in Liverpool because of Pete getting dumped. Do, do, do you agree with? I mean, do you understand that, or can you explain that? I don't think so. I mean, I, you know, I'll be honest with you. People have talked about it in the past, but I, I, I don't know about now. You know, mm. I, I really don't. Yeah. It's the, it is fifty years ago, you know, or more. Right. Sure. But, right. You right. know, I mean, <laughs> I think it was more. I think it was one of those things that every the different people had different opinions. You know, mm-hmm. it was just a, it was a talking point. You know. Mm-hmm. But um, what was what was your impression of the group when Ringo joined? I, I really didn't know because um, I, I, I saw them at the cavern, and mm-hmm. but I thought they were very good. Obviously, at that time, there was a lot of people who were annoyed because people had been, you know, pushed out the van. But then, when I started working with the Beatles and touring with them, um, they were of a solid together unit, you know, mm-hmm. and and he brought things to the Beatles that, that Pete didn't, you know, I mean, I, I just thought he, um, he had more, more tools in, in his toolbox than Pete, you know, exactly. That's, okay. that's what I thought. And I, you know, and as, as time's gone by, um, I think it's been proven that, you know, Ringo Starr, the drum parts he came up with for the Beatles were very unique. And I don't think anybody else would have, done them as well or even thought it, they were very creative drum parts and different but they mm-hmm. fitted in with what, what the guys wanted mm-hmm. you know I was going to say that I, I was listening today to one of Billy's early albums um, called Listen was that your first album? Yeah. And yes. the music you're doing is actually quite different from what the Beatles were doing there was a, a, more of a a kind of 50s-ish sound, and this is 1963, and you've got, you know, to do Ron Ron and Great Balls of Fire. And so, although I think you got to be known a little later for doing all of those songs that Lennon and McCartney wrote for you, you were, you were actually doing a sort of, you weren't really doing the same thing they were doing at the same time. You you had your own. Well, you know, I, I just didn't, re- I mean, let's face it, I mean, I didn't really, I, I didn't think of the material as much. I thought the beats were very, shrewd in what they did they 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 picked songs that not not every band was doing mm-hmm. you mm-hmm. know and everybody thought that they were the the beatles songs you know um <laughs> you know i i'd never heard anybody doing you know slow down and money and and say i mean i'd i'd heard the chuck berry things you know mm-hmm. but at the time i mean I, I i thought i think i was it took me a while i was still you know, get, get my feet wet and still searching for what I w- wanted to do and how I wanted to sing, you know. Uh, I mean, like, to, even today, I approach it in a whole different way, you know. Mm-hmm. It's it's very hard to to uh, step outside the box and come up with things that, that people can identify with. And, you know, I've thought a lot more over the years than obviously when I first started, you know. Mm-hmm. I didn't want to get into Chuck Berry and stuff like that because... Quite frankly, everybody was doing it. Sure, sure. Nobody's doing it now, so I might try it now. (laughs) Well, you did a pretty good Great Balls of Fire, I've got to say. Uh, Yeah, yeah, um, it was pretty good. But, you know, a lot of, you know, it's sort of like, you know, people say, oh, uh, Billy Kramer, the the balladeer. Well, frankly, I, I, I think I can sing rock and roll as good as what I can sing ballads and mm-hmm. that's not being blood. It's not being blase, you know, mm-hmm. it's, it's, it's a fact, you know, and, uh, I, I like to sing as many different types of songs, um, as I can. Billy, you talk in the book about uh, a demo that John made for you of, uh, uh, do you want to know a secret, which you say in the book is, is, is lost. I'm, that's too bad. But uh, can you describe a little bit of that? Um, cause, uh, um, it was um, it was very it was a a Grundig tape, you know, a spool, mm-hmm. and he he described on on the tape that um, he uh, had done it in the quietest room he could find, and he apologized for the quality. And at the end of the song, he flushed the toilet, you know, which I. <laughs> I thought it was like, you know, uh, very funny. You know, uh, it was very basic, and I 
led the song with the Dakotas. We we came up with the arrangement and uh, we did it the way we did it. You know, um, uh, I th- I think we made a very good record of it. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, you know, um, it, to me, uh, it was a surprise. I didn't know whether it was going to be a hit or not. Mm. You know, you, you can't always tell. Right. Um, but I, I, th- I think we, you know, we we made a good record. You don't um, know what happened to the. You don't know what happened to the demo, though. Well, you know, I mean, in them days, you never thought about collecting things. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. uh, I don't know whether the band picked it up. It's like you know, handwritten lyrics and stuff like that. You know, at the end of the day, we used to. I just we used to walk out and leave everything. Mm. You know, you know that's that's just the way it was. You know, yeah, mm-hmm. mm-hmm. uh, you know, I was I was a nineteen year old kid from Liverpool. I, I never thought it it would uh, you know end up the way it has. You know, mm-hmm. yeah. And these things would be if you know. I mean, quite frankly, I, I did the every town and every city we did weeks in. I never, I never asked the Beatles for an autograph. I just thought, you know, I thought there's enough of that going on without me, you know, <laughs> jumping in. You know, I, I never bothered. Outside of the, the uh, I'm sure you, you appeared on the BBC several times. Outside of that, did you ever record, the, the band ever record live? Believe it or not, we, we recorded live on, on a tour in the United States. And it was produced by... Uh, I think Ron Goodman, who, who, who no, Ron, who, who produced the Hollies. Oh, Ron was, Richard. Ron Richard. Ron, Ron Richard came over to the States and we were going to do a, a live album, but it was just like, it, it, it was, there was so much hysteria going on that it was uh, undecipherable. You know, a few years ago, um, they managed to, you know, with today's technology to be, uh, to be able to make some of it you know, made it good, and it's, it, you know, it surprised me. Has but, it been put out? It hasn't been put out, though, right? Uh, it was on, there was a box set a few years ago on, uh, oh, oh, okay. one, of the, one of the CDs was, CDs was that, you know. Okay. I think I know which box set you're talking about now. Yeah. But, uh, okay. Mm-hmm. That's the box set with the John Lennon, I'm in love, uh, mm-hmm. song. Right. Mm-hmm. You know. Right. Right. Which was um, a funny time, you know. We were at EMI. I think we were doing doing a B side of one of the other records, and John and Paul come running in saying, "You got to record this song. You got to record this song." And uh, we put put it down within like we only had like fifteen twenty minutes left, and uh, I think we did two takes, and um, it lay there for years. And uh, I don't know why we just didn't think of it, but. The next thing I I was in uh, Mickey Mantle's eating and I heard it come over the tannoy and I was like, what? <laughs> 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 about you know about forty years later you know mm-hmm. um, there was a I think they put it out because there was some bantering with John Lennon and I there was a lot yeah. that they cut out some of the bantering they didn't you know mm-hmm. you know. Mm-hmm. Um, he made this come out like you. You sound like Adam Faith, you fool. <laughs> <laughs> but there was other things, <laughs> you know. It actually came out on a, a compilation in 1991. Yeah. I interviewed you at the time when it came out, and yeah. um, it's 25 tracks, the best of Billy J. Kramer and the Dakotas, and you can hear the bantering at the very beginning. It's very faint. It's they got to struggle mm. sometimes to make out what you and John are saying, but. Uh, well, I, I well I couldn't get the tune you see and then when I did, he said you sound like Adam Faith you fool, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, but there was other things that uh, I think they did uh, turn it up a bit as you know on on other discs, mm-hmm. but I thought it was kind of cheap of EMI you know it, it annoyed me. Mm. You know, mm. I thought, you know, I don't think making enough out of the Beatles without doing stuff like this. Mm-hmm. You know, but before was, you, sorry, you were saying I before was, when you were talking about Do You Want to Know a Secret, that it was your own arrangement, the band's own arrangement. Yes. Didn't, um, didn't John and Paul kind of guide you through their songs, how they wanted it to sound? Uh, with that song, we, we learned it just prior to Hamburg. 
and we played it over in Hamburg. They did come down to the studio when we recorded the song, but they were quite happy with the way we played it. Mm. You know. Did you guys prefer mono over stereo, Billy, or did you did, were you okay with with the stereo remixes on on your songs? I, I what I've heard that I didn't like the, some of the stereo stuff sounded mm-hmm. weird to me. You know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, I've had, I mean, we know the we know the Beatles didn't like it, and, and uh, I know and Peter Asher told me one time that he didn't like it uh, with their stuff, and and I I was just curious how you felt too. It, it uh, sounds it doesn't sound it sounds strange to me. Mm. You know, it's like it's it's different, the, but it's not a pleasing different. You know, it's mm-hmm. acceptable, but it's to me I prefer it the way it was. Okay. Did you have any input in the on the on any of the mixes at all, or? Uh, no, I mean, you know, I'll be honest with you. You know, I mean, we we did our thing, and um, that was it. In the, back in them days, yeah. we we would get an acetate maybe, and uh, or they'd mix it on a different day. Mm-hmm. You know, as time went by, you know, there was there was things like I, I made certain records where. I did go back in the studio and uh, re- remake them, remix them, and things like that. You know, mm-hmm. I had I had a ballad called "You Make Me Feel Like Someone," and um, mm. when, when I got an acetate with that, I, I you know, um, said this is you know not good enough, and I flew down to London and we remixed it, we redid the vocals and everything. You know, but you know, let's face it, we were all young kids. We what did we know about recording and it? In, in the very early days, mm-hmm. you know. Sure. sure. You did a song, uh, apart from the things that you did that John and Paul wrote, you did a song that George Martin and Barb, Bob Wooler wrote called um, right. I Know. <laughs> so do you yeah. Want, can you tell us something about that? And and also maybe yeah. what it was like working with George Martin, seeing as, you know, he just mm, died Yeah. Uh, well, you know, I, I mean, at the time, I mean, I knew nothing about publishing, and to me it was, it's a song and it's a B-side, and, um, it, it was something that uh, came very quickly and, and it was very easy, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't think I would do that today, you know. <laughs> um, George, um, to me, George was a gentleman and um, he was uh, a big help in, in putting the songs together, mm-hmm. you know. But there were times when um, we had differences of opinion on, on certain things. Mm-hmm. You know, but I mean, it was no big deal. You know, I, I commented when I recorded "Bad to Me." I said, you know, it's in the wrong key, and he said, I think he said I think it should be in E. I said I think it should be in D, and we tried it in E for half a day, and then after lunch we tried it in D, and it worked. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. which is one of those things. Mm-hmm. I mean, quite honestly, I recorded "I Call Your Name." that day within about 20 minutes and I wanted it to sound like I wanted it to be an A-side and George said you sound like John Lennon and I said well that can't be bad you know but uh, <laughs> but I, I didn't have to any real say in what they put out you know mm. but I, I, I had to put that out you know because I thought it was a uh, more rocky than the things I'd done and I always had the feeling you know um, with with both Brian and George you know they were quite content to keep me in in that one particular place, and, and I always felt that the time to change is, you know, it's not just waiting until you have a few records that don't do so well and then change. I, I felt the time to change was when it was still happening for you, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, and um, you know, I, I was never, I, I was very unassuming and not a pushy kind of person back then, uh, else I would have made changes, you know. And gone for more rocky type of songs. Mm-hmm. You know, um, we we had a very young audience, and and uh, I felt it was the kind of thing they wanted. Mm-hmm. And I felt, you know, uh, you have to break out of the bank. Sure. You know, I, but it was a very enjoyable period. Very, it was a learning period. It was a, the start. You know, I mean, what better start can you have than? Um, you know, firstly, John Lennon coming up with the name Billy J. Kramer, you know, mm-hmm. um, and then you're being produced by George Martin. It's 
that was a really a, a good start for me. Mm-hmm. You know? <laughs> um, when you went, you went to New York with Brian in November '63. And yeah. we think of that trip now as when Brian arranged the Ed Sullivan shows for the Beatles, but he, he actually went to look into your career, I think, with Liberty Records, mm. right? I mean, that you you were actually the primary reason for that trip. Do you, do you remember I think that? that? I remember that trip. I think it, it, it was, you know, um, I think it was to push me on Liberty Records, but I think it was also to get Ed Sullivan and things like that together you know uh i i'd seen the competition in america mm-hmm. uh, and you would be very difficult you know uh, cliff richard who is still the biggest selling artist in great britain had failed to crack the market you know the market was very strange i mean like i remember like ralph harris was number one with timey kangaroo down sport and right <laughs> you, know, <laughs> it, you know and um it's funny, you know, because we were staying in the Waldorf Astoria and I remember playing some of Jerry's records and Silla's records and my records. I don't think people were really hip to it, you know. Mm-hmm. They, they just didn't know about the Beatles, you know, and I said, well, I think you will in a short time, mm-hmm. you know, because I still had all the newspapers with Beatlemania and stuff like that, which I showed people. Mm-hmm. You know? mm-hmm. I guess he yeah. should have taken you to see Mary the K. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. That's right. Yeah. I, mean, I didn't know anything about this scene. That's all. That's all you know. And Brian it was a whole. No, I don't, I don't suppose so. So, you know, let's face it. I mean, I, America at that time was a whole different thing. And um, you know, to, to, to me, this, this, you know, it's very obvious that it took something as big and as unique as the Beatles to open the doors, mm-hmm. you know, and they opened the doors for everybody, I felt, you know, um, they opened the doors for all, you know, the British invasion, and a lot of guys got a break who I don't think would have done, you know, and I still think that, you know, a, a lot of British people are still selling records there today, and I think it's only because of the Beatles, you know, mm-hmm. sure. to me, that. They they uh they were amazing. You know. What was it like being caught up in that whole storm in you know, in early sixty four, Billy, with the and and being you know, kind of with the Beatles leading the crest, what was it what was it like for you and uh it, you know, to be in that in that wave? Uh, it was a lot of excitement, you know, very different, you know, I mean, it, it was a great experience. Um, it was very exciting, you know, when, to play places that are so big that you could drive into in a coach, you know. Mm. It was so, you know, in England, we'd arrive at a theatre and you, you'd fight your way in. There was no security. and <laughs> You know, we you fight your way out. And when, when we went to, came to America... You know, we just drove in in a coach and did these big shows and drove out. It was, it was a whole. It was, it was amazing. You know, it's a, uh, it was a great time. You know, I, I'm just, I, I really, am thankful that I was there to to share this and get that experience because, you know, I don't think anything like that will ever happen again. You know, mm-hmm. I think, I think it's the greatest chapter. In the history of rock and roll music, I don't mm-hmm. think anything, anything will ever top it. And to be there and right at the start and, and see it all happen is fantastic. You know. Hmm. Hmm. You mentioned before that you know that you have this kind of image of the you know the balladeer singer, and but that you actually preferred to do more rock and roll. Now, of the say the you know the Lennon McCartney team then. Which one of the two did you feel closer to musically, John or Paul? It, it, it depended, you know. On, on you know, funny enough, they used to both come together, you know. Mm-hmm. And you know, I've never been one of this these people who've analyzed. Well, John wrote this, and Paul. I'm certain, right. John, I'm like certain we, John, like we do, yeah. <laughs> I, I'm certain John wrote. You want to know a secret? I'm certain he wrote bad to me and I call your name. 
I think from a window to me it was definitely Paul. Yeah. Because he came on his own that day. <laughs> uh, I'll keep you satisfied. They both came on. Mm -hmm. You know, that was it. You know, John came on his own when I did bad to me. Mm -hmm. But, uh, uh, you know, kind of as your, you know, your musical, you know, your own musical preference, did you feel closer to one or the other? Um, I, th I think John, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. You know, he was, uh, I think he was the rock and roll guy, you know, A of the Edge. Right. Mm -hmm. you know? But they were all unique in, in for different ways, you know. Mm -hmm. So, you know, they had John with his, you know, his stuff and Paul with his his stuff and his balladeer stuff and the, the, you know to me it was the whole thing. One of the things I, I really enjoyed going through the book was how honest you are. It's not a your book is not a is really honest in some spots and, and very opinionated about the way things were going. And um, let me just ask you briefly about three uh, three people. Brian would be one of them. Uh, John would be another, and Scylla would be the other. Mm, um, right. Give me just a, a real thumbnail on each of the each of the three of them, Billy. Brian was a, a gentleman, and was was very very kind and considerate. Scylla, uh, I, I would um, take us into my parents' home, and we'd sit and have tea and biscuits, and um, mm -hmm. you know, it, it was that kind of a, a relationship, really. I was always like, funny enough, when I was on tour, I was always saying to her and her husband, what's the matter with you? Because, like, believe it or not, you know, I, I was the, the quiet, humble guy, but I was partying like an animal then, you know. <laughs> and, and I would say, like, I, I don't know how people like you can just do a gig and have all that attention and just go home to bed. I, I'm still buzzing. i got to be out on the town, you know. Mm-hmm. That that's how I was, and um, I, I was I was never well, actually I was never afraid to to talk to any of the Beatles, you know. Uh, John, there was that incident uh, at Paul's twenty first, which is to me it's like uh, a story that's been told so many different ways. But you mm -hmm. know, he to me it was just uh, he had too many drinks and he was he was out of line, you know. Mm -hmm. I was very sorry that uh, a lot of things. Yeah, you know, I, I I never reacquainted myself with John after some time. You know, when he moved to America, and I regret that I didn't take up the opportunity to do that. You know, mm -hmm. were you here by then? But, yeah, uh, I I, can't, I was here doing work, working. You know, mm -hmm. and I it just I just thought I could leave him alone. He was in a different place. You know, um, he divorced Cynthia, who I I like very much. I was very fond of her you know um i was a bit shocked and surprised when he went off with yoko and i just thought you know uh, we we rolled you know at that time i i was married myself i had two children and we'd all found different roads it was just mm -hmm. that's the way it was you know can you talk okay. a little bit more about george martin and and what he brought to your recordings did he make suggestions at all on the arrangements of them he, he he made suggestions, um, uh, uh, like in the constructions of the songs and and the, the chords. You know, he would because he was a refined musician. You know, like when John came along with Bed to Me, George um, to me was the guy who put the icing on the song. You know, he'd, he'd find he'd say to the guys like, instead of playing a sharp, can you play a, a flat or a diminished? Or, or whatever, you know. And he work on the arrangement actually more with the band than me, you know, mm -hmm. in, in, putting, in putting it together. And, you know, he would do things like he, he would overdub, you know, he'd overdub the piano, playing the same lines as the bass, which really pushed the track along, you know, a lot of mm. stuff. But I'm not going to tell you everything. Read the read the book. Yeah, yeah. read the book. <laughs> you know, at first, when I first met George, I mean, that, you know, it took a while for me to to get comfortable. I felt I was talking to the, the Duke of Edinburgh. You know, <laughs> he, 
he was so uh, refined and well spoken, and I was like this scouse from Liverpool, you know. Mm-hmm. You mentioned wow. Scylla before. I just wanted to ask you about Scylla because. To people in America, we don't know her that well, mm. and, and unfortunately, she's more a footnote in Beatle history. Right. Uh, you know what did what did she mean to you, and also to England, because she was such a big star there. Uh, she actually she became like um, really big, and it wasn't for uh, singing. She went into hosting TV shows, you know, like the the dating game, and you know things like that and mm-hmm. she had she had a terrific personality mm-hmm. you know she was she, she 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 was a you know a lot of fun to to the public and you know she the public really took her on you know it's a, yeah and i think you know funny enough i think it started by there was one tv show a series she was doing and in the last series she was like crying and i think you know the public do they are oh, the poor girl you know, I, I wasn't a put on, but people just loved her, everything she did. Mm-hmm. She, she was the girl next door or whatever, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You also mentioned in the book, you have a picture of yourself and Davy Jones, and you mentioned that, that you met Davy uh, um, when he was doing uh, Oliver. Um, yes. Can you talk just briefly about Davy and, and, and your friendship with him? Um, you know, I met him then very briefly. And... Um, I, I thought he was a cute kid, and I think he was very good. I thought he was very talented, and and then when um, the monkey started, I, I to me um, he 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 was um, he was one of the few people that uh, he is like what I said before about some people have this charismatic thing, and to me, Davy Jones was the guy in the monkeys with that. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I think you know the. The, the, I don't know, but I don't know the other monkeys that well. But to me, Davy was was the was the monkeys. I don't think the monkeys would have been the monkeys without J Davy. You know, that personality and that smile and charm. And, and he was a very talented. You know, he could dance and sing, and he he, he was a real talent. You know, hmm. interesting. And uh, that's my take on it. You know. Okay. Uh, I don't I don't know whether I'm off beam or not. You know, um, I know Mickey Dolan sang on a lot of the records and he did a very good job. But you know, I thought the magic came from from Davy. Mm. Yeah, there was there was a lot there. There was definitely a lot of charisma going going with him. Uh, and and you know, and and obviously one of the reasons he was picked was he was British. I think that had that. Oh uh, no! You think that? I, <laughs> <laughs> Do you know, I never, I never thought of that one. I, I, really? No, I never. I thought he was just picked because he was great for that part. Oh, I think he was great for the part too. But I think the the British thing had a had a whole lot to do with it. Um, it it, it really did. I think he'd have made it anyway. I think he would have too, because he had started. He had started long before that. I mean, he he had that solo contract with Coal Gems, and yes. Coal Gems had tried push tried to push him before Oliver because I've seen the ads and and uh, so oh yeah, I'm, uh, it's very it, it's very you know that's that's a good point there, that uh, he would he would have made it he definitely yeah would. yeah he was a lot of fun you know um, my wife and I rode with him in limos on quite a few occasions and. He was very funny. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Hey, Billy, can you talk a little bit about the other acts that Brian managed at the time, like Jerry and the Pacemakers and the Foremost? And there were a lot of acts in his stable. And I was yeah. wondering if at any one time was it was it ever too much for him to handle to juggle all these acts? And just bear in mind that he had to deal with the Beatles, too. He dealt with um, the biggest band in the world, so he had all these acts at the same time. What was it know, like for him? Uh, I don't know what it was like for him, but all I know is this: that you know, it was it was kind of strange because I always felt it was like it was like the Beatles month, and everything was the Beatles, and then it was Jerry's month, and then it'd be my month, and then it'd be mm. Silla's month. You know, <laughs> uh, and, you know, and, and you know, you know. I often say to my wife that the amazing thing with Brian was I could, I could always call him. Anytime and get a hold of him 
without a problem. You know, whereas today you send people an email and they take a month to answer it. You know, um, mm. as, as as big as uh, as organization became, you know, um, he uh, always had the time for his artists. I think, I I, I think you know, um, think had he lived, I think things would have changed. You know, um, when the Beatles decided to you not know, tour anymore. You know, because I think, you know, I, I don't really know because I never spoke in any great detail to Brian about it, you know. Um, but I think, let's face it, really, um, they were off the road and I don't think there was the same amount of pressure on him, you know, as, as there was before. You know, he, like, he came to see me. Um, the last time I saw Brian was at the Shakespeare in Liverpool. And he said, you know, You've you've worked very hard on your craft, and um, I'm going to states, and and the next time, you know, when I come back, I will, we'll work on a new project and get you back back out there, record wise. And um, I was going to make records for his record label, and uh, obviously it didn't happen, you know. And it, that was a big loss for the whole the whole of show business, but it was a a big loss for me, you know. I was. Uh, I didn't know the business, and you know I was very protected by Brian, mm. and every, all his artists were. I don't know what their relationship. I don't know what Jerry's relationship was with him. You know, we never discussed it. We worked together, but things like that never came up. You know, mm -hmm. um, that's just. You know, I, I never. I didn't know what, what a relationship was with Brian was like. Uh, I've, I've, I've having a clue. You know, I mean. I did hear recently that, you know, um, a husband was taking over a career when a contract ran out with Brian, and Brian was upset about it. But, you know, I, I don't know whether that is true. You, you hear little bits and pieces like that. But, you know, I, I'm basically a person that I just get on doing what, what I'm doing, you know. I try to not get involved in other people's things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When the Beatles started Apple, did you consider approaching them about recording for for that label you know i never i i you know i at that time i'll be very honest with you i was uh wasn't really thinking about my career i was I, i'm very honest in saying i was more interested in having a good time mm -hmm. you know I, you know i was more interested in where where it was all happening and where i could think i was having fun i wasn't but uh that's where what i was up to you know mm -hmm. I was more interested in going to clubs and bars and stuff like that, you know. So were you still giving think... concerts at that time? Sure. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, I was still doing concerts. I'd, you know, I'd, I'd party and I'd, around London and then I'd go on the road and mm -hmm. do what I had to do, you know. I, I, at the time, you know, I just thought, um, as long as I go on the stage and I, don't, I do a good job, that's, that's all that matters. That's, you know, and it's nobody else's business what I do when I'm away from the from performing, you know. Uh, and in a way, I knew I know I was wrong because it's uh, you know, it was my business to, to be a sort of role model. I felt in some sort of way, you know. Mm -hmm. Sure. Besides the book coming out, um, what other plans have you got going in uh, in the uh, next few months? Um, I, I've got plans for quite a few things that are at a very early stage that I'm, you know, um, I'm thinking about. One is for a, a show, a, a performance, that I want, a particular way I want to do a show that I want to record and film. Um, it's it's going to be like a multimedia thing. It's going to be live, so people see live music. It's going to be sort of my version of like uh, the history of rock and roll. Um, yeah. It's going to have uh, audience, you know, participation and stuff like that. Um, it's something which is very early, and we're we're just putting the ideas together. Because mm -hmm. uh, you know, I mean, you know, it's, it's uh, <laughs> I hate to be morbid, but you know, uh, I'm at a time in my life where I just want to try and do as many things as I can. And while while I enjoy it, which I do mm -hmm. immensely, I, I want to do 
as many things as I can. Well, that's not morbid. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, there's nothing more. There's nothing more than that. But you know, I mean, uh, I've had a lot of friends and a lot of people close that have died recently, and it's uh, mm-hmm. you do think about that, you know. Oh yeah, sure. Oh yeah. You know, none of us are immortal. You know. True. Mm-hmm. Billy, you made an album a few years ago called "I Won the Fight," yes. which uh, you know I know you're very proud of, and I've gotten the chance to to see you perform many of the songs from it. And apart yeah. from the fact that the songs are really outstanding, you've actually been very involved with songwriting in recent years. Is that yes. something that's that's uh, only happened recently for you? Is it something that comes naturally to you? Talk well, about the know, songwriting. Uh, the songwriting when I. When I we used to try and get involved with the Dakotas, they like kind of pushed me out of it. So I didn't I didn't really bother, and I was always uh, felt that the, a lot of my ideas weren't good enough. And and I wrote the song uh, Liverpool with Love, uh, which started with me just playing a guitar in the house, and I came up with a line that you know I had a girl named Maureen, and my wife said that's pretty catchy. And I just worked on it till I uh, put the whole thing together. And then I, at that time, I wrote uh, Sunsets of Santa Fe. I won the fight. It was Funny enough, it was more or less just me and a couple of musicians one day started jamming along, and it just happens, you know. Mm-hmm. And since then, um, I've been working on a lot of different, different songs. I, I try to do something nearly every day now. Mm. That's you great. Know, you know, I've got a, quite a lot of songs put aside already. So, if you have to... a new album project that maybe some of these songs might turn up in? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm sure. It's I'm great sure. to see you when when we see you in concert. Now, you mix the old with the new, right? And, uh, you know, people get to hear that you know you're still vital, you're still out there, you're still being very creative. And in um, so many ways, you know, the fact that you're so heavily involved with the songwriting, that's, well, that's very impressive. Uh, well, thank you. You know, I mean, I, I uh, you know, I won the fight was the first time I ever sort of did a whole project myself. You mm. know, uh, it, it was all my input. It was things that I'd had in mind for many years and just really hadn't, I'd, n- I'd never felt I was in the right place to do them. And, uh, it just suddenly all one thing rolled into another, and I'm very proud of the album, uh, and that's it. You know, I'm, I'm glad that it 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 did have songs on it that that took me away from from what I'd done in the past. I'll always have to do the old songs, but I thought that that some of the songs were good songs, and and people saw a, a side of me that they hadn't before. You know. Yeah. There, mm-hmm. there was. There was uh, rockabilly, there was rock, there was country and ballads. You know, that's why I thought it was good. You know. Yeah, we were talking before the show about how when I've seen you live, one of my favorite uh, moments in your show is when you're, you're kind of off the cuff and you're just you're doing a lot of 50s rock and roll and what you feel like doing in the moment. And it comes across as being very spontaneous. Well, you know, um, <laughs> when we have a a rehearsal with the band, I always say I I run through that section, and I'll write down say half a dozen songs and say these are the songs we're going to do. But when I get on the stage, I don't know why I just forget I just forget them and go on to other things. Mm. Uh, they're just so good, so good. Uh, they're such great musicians that they they can just fall into it, you know. And it's all about fun. That's another thing, you know. It is about, it's, it's, uh, you know, it's life is too serious to take serious. That's <laughs> right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And uh, in just about a month, you're going to be appearing at the uh, the Fest for Beatles fans. Yes. In, uh, at the Hilton Westchester in in Rye, uh, New York, and uh, you have uh, you have a great band behind you. It's, tell us uh, tell us something about the uh, your your current band's lineup. The current band is Liberty DeVito on drums. Right. Mm. Um, Muddy Shoes on bass. Andy Burton on keyboards. And and, and we're going to have um, Steve Conte on guitar. 
Wow. Um, mm-hmm. That's who's going to be playing at Beetlefest. <laughs> and another, another rhythm player, uh, Larry Fitzgerald. That's going to be the band. Mm-hmm. Terrific. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, you know, it's, I, I just, you know, it's, it's amazing that, you know, to have been around as long as I have and, and still have as much fun and enjoyment, you know. <laughs> and and, and the, to me, the, the, my friends and my people, you know, I think they all know me and I know them. It's one of them things, you know. They're all very nice and they say, you know, nice to see you, Billy, and it, it's a good feeling, you know. That's part of the joy in seeing you live is, is seeing the enthusiasm in you because you still love performing so much. And I, uh, I also get a big kick out of, and lots of Beatle fans will be very happy to know that in addition to all the Lennon-McCartney stuff from the 60s that, that, you, that you recorded then and had hits with, you also cover other material, and you've done Jealous Guy in concert. Yes. You've done a really nice version of that. You did right. Handle With Care. Handle With Care. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, you know, I mean, the, the, to me, the, the great songs. And, um, you know, at the time, it was, it was what I wanted to do. You know, um, it's, it's, it's so funny because I remember when I first wanted to do Jealous Guy, we had someone in the band who said, well, you're not John Lennon. And I said, I know I'm not. <laughs> you know, I said, um, I'm who I am. I'm, I'm going to sing the song. It's a good song. And I'm... I'm going to do it the way I would do it, and and we did it, you know. And uh, I was very proud to do the song, and and very pleased with the response it got. You know, uh, I did it on a tour, uh, the Solid Silver Sixties tour in England, and people loved it. You know, mm. I was very happy about that. No, it's it's really moving your version of it, mm. right? Yeah. Well, you know. Um, it's one of them songs. It's 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 a, a good song to sing, you know. Right. And, and I enjoy it. You know, that's it. I mean, when you think about it, you shouldn't sing songs you don't enjoy. <laughs> you know? Right. And you feel you feel so much at home when I hear you do the other British Invasion stuff from the '60s. I mean, yeah. you do Glad All Over, and it's it's wonderful. That's such a a crowd pleaser. Well, you know, the, you know the. You know, I, I, I've seen a lot of performance, and one thing I'm not is, you know, I, I've always, I'm not, I've never been self-indulgent. And in a set list, I always consider how this, you know, even if it's a new song, is this song good enough that people hearing it first time, it's going to register with them, and they're going to enjoy it. And, you know, um, I, I, I do think about the audience a lot, you know. Mm-hmm. Because that's the bottom line is that's what you're there for. You're there to do a show, mm-hmm. to please people, make people happy, and uh, have a good time, as well as have a good time yourself. Mm-hmm. Sure, mm-hmm. sure. Well, we're just a bit out of time here, and Billy, it's been great having you on the show. It's I want to so remind. Fast. It's gone yeah. so fast. We'll have to be on again. Yes. <laughs> oh yeah. I mean, we spent more we time with waiting for you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, there's all, there's yeah, all these te- the, all these technical spe- problems that our that our listeners don't even know about with Skype uh, and all. And uh, yeah. well, I'm going to tell sometimes. Them. <laughs> <laughs> no, we're I'm in trouble now. Outtakes. We're going to put out the outtakes one day. Uh, Where's Dave? Tell. Where's Ken? <laughs> yeah. HMC I, is going to get our outtakes. <laughs> yeah. I missed no. the show a few months ago because I couldn't get. Skype to work, so. Right. Oh, that's, well, you better call Mr. Skype. <laughs> okay. Yeah, that's, uh, there we go. Well, listen, it's been nice talking to all of you. And uh, are you all going to fest? I Absolutely. will be there. I, I will, be, I will there. be there. Well, don't forget to come say hello. Oh, uh, we won't sure? forget it all. And we want um, to remind everybody, your book is called Do You Want to Know a Secret? The yeah. Fest. The fest happens the weekend of April 15th through the 17th, again at the, the Hilton Westchester in Rye Brook, New York. And you will be there, Billy, and we look forward to seeing you. Thank and, you so and much. Flip, and let me mention that the book has a lot of stories about the Beatles and a lot of other people. But, I mean, there are some, and there's rare pictures in there. It's, it's, a, it's a great book. It really is. Thank you, Steve. You're welcome, Billy. Uh, 
I'll be digging into the book right after this conversation ends. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. All right. So anybody have anything they'd like to plug before we go? Anything to plug? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just anybody, if anybody wants to get a hold of me, they can contact me at beatlesexaminer at gmail.com. I will be, I, yes, I will be performing on the Saturday afternoon. Right. You know, because sometimes people don't know and that they might miss it. Or, you know, but I, I'll, I'll be performing on the Saturday afternoon. And your okay. book will be there, right? You'll be uh, able to sell book, your book there? Yes, definitely. And you'll be signing be, copies. Of course I will. And everyone else okay. who doesn't go um, yeah. has to wait until May 3rd to get it in the bookstore, right? That's right. right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But, yeah, as, far, as far as the technical problems that we have in the show, I have the name of someone named Alex that I'm supposed to be contacting. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that'll, that'll be helping us oh. out at all. Magic oh, that's, yes, a, yes. There's a, that's a great that's a great line. Well, the thing is, though, I, I think it's a good it's a great idea to be able to sit around and talk about things. It's it's great. Oh, you know? yeah. And well, and the fun thing is that we're on all sides of the country. We're not we're not uh, located in one spot. That's you know, cool. that's that's the cool thing. You know, it's uh, and it's good knowing you people. You know, it's it's kind of weird calling stations that you don't know anybody. <laughs> Oh, no. sure. Yeah. 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 Well, anytime but, you want to talk to us, Billy, feel free. I mean, let us know. We, we, we'll, you know, we're always glad to have you. Thank you so much. We use the word royalty, and you are just that, you know, because mm-hmm. uh, you've got so much history to share, and uh, always you can talk about whatever you're doing today here on the show. Thank you very much, Al. You got something you want to plug? It. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> are we finished? Uh, actually, well, we didn't we didn't wrap up the show completely, but uh, you know I just want Al and Alan to say their goodbyes and if they have anything to plug, and I have one thing to plug. Uh, so, not, nothing, nothing from this end. Uh, All the, right. The only thing I would say is that if you guys haven't caught up with my obituary of George Martin in yes. the New York Times, and also I had a companion piece about his production techniques on five recordings of the Beatles, you can find it at nytimes.com. And both are and that, excellent. Yes. And that, that uh, production techniques uh, article got uh, tweeted by Michael Nesmith. Oh, yeah. That was a kick. <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah, it was. Well, you know, the, you know I, I was saying that the, 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 the amazing thing about George Martin is the technology then as to what it is now. And what he did was amazing, uh, you know, to make the albums and, and to make Sgt. Pepper – Mm. To me, that's yeah. the ge- that to me shows the genius. Oh, yeah. Right. Right. You know. Right. right. No, you know, there's no auto tune. You know. Right. No, no mm-hmm. computers. And he he did it. You know. Mm-hmm. You know he, he did. did it. And also, EMI was kind of behind the times, uh, technically, compared uh, to what was going on in the U.S. Correct. I yeah. think they, they. I think they dragged a bit. You know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But that's yeah, but that's that's British. <laughs> oh. <laughs> right. Four four tracks. That's that's yeah, all. Right. Yes. So I'll see you guys. Okay. All right, Billy. Billy. All, all right. right, Billy. Take care. Bye-bye. Okay. And I just want to mention one thing. I do have a special contest that by the time this show gets posted should be up on my website. We just had Jude Kessler as a guest here on our show. And uh, I'll be giving folks the chance to win two of her books, as well as her husband, uh, Randy Kessler, with a a poster of the doors of famous uh, venues in in Beatle history, like the Beatles family's homes. You can win that on my website, and Jude will be a guest at the upcoming uh, Grammy Museum Beatles Symposium in Mm -hmm. Cleveland, Mississippi. That's on April 1st and 2nd, and she will also be a guest at the fest as well. Right. Uh, right. April 15th through the 17th at uh, the Hilton Westchester in Rybrook. Okay, so if you can, check out my website for the special contest to win Jude's books and the Randy Kessler poster at KenMichaelsRadio.com. All right. And so for Billy J. Kramer, Steve Marinucci, Al Sussman, and Alan Cozen, this is Ken Michaels thanking all of you for listening, and we will see you next time. <laughs>